I'm, I'm Steve Fisher. I'm your convener facilitator for this afternoon. We've got a rip-roaring first half of the afternoon um, with the team that you see on the right there, on, on your left, my right, um, an all-male team. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. Um, this, the theme is knowledge to practice, and, and really as people working on applied research, Practice should be the main thing that we're concerned about. So when we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror and we think, you know, what are we doing today at work? It should be about practice because the knowledge generated by CRCs and especially by Ninti One is all about impact on the ground. So this theme this afternoon for the first part of the afternoon is about knowledge to practice. And we've selected um, four topics we'd like to talk to you about uh, on that theme. The first one is about camels, feral camels. Uh, then we're going to talk about the work of the Aboriginal community researchers in that field. Then we'll talk about uh, precision pastoral, giving more detail than uh, was provided this morning. And finally, we're going to move on to remote education systems. So with that introduction, I'd like to just uh, invite our first speaker to join us now. And he's Quinton Hart. He's the, he's the manager of the National Feral Camel Management Project. Uh, Quentin's been working for 15 years in the field of uh, pest animal management and control before he joined NT1 and has put a, a great deal of hard work into this project. So we're delighted that he's here to share that with us. Uh, Quentin, please. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, two separate projects that, uh, that Ninti One's been involved with uh, in relation to camels. Um, the current project, which is the operational phase, um, but it was informed by a previous research project. So the current project, the Australian Feral Camel Management Project, <clears throat> it's a very large project in, uh, in a number of ways, uh, $16.6 .6 million um, over four years plus partner contributions, 20 project partners, which is... Um, uh, a large number to, uh, to keep happy, and a large geographic area, over 3 million square kilometres, uh, hundreds of landholders in that area, in different land tenures, and um, the project started in 2009-10 financial year, but it was informed by um, a research project that was um, uh, coordinated by the Desert Knowledge CRC, um, which is uh, the previous CRC managed by Ninti One. Uh, that was a three-year research project. Um, and its overall objective was to develop a national management framework. And in doing that, it had to collect all the baseline information on uh, what was happening with the feral camel population, uh, stakeholder perceptions, and particularly landholder perceptions, which are, which are everything in, in terms of land management, uh, reviewed the legislation, assessed feral camel impacts, and reviewed management options. And it was a very comprehensive bit of work and um, it led to a direct performance indicator that the, in, in terms of a density target for camels that the Australian government was able to use uh, in its current for our country business plan. And I think that the comprehensiveness of that, that work um, was instrumental in, in giving the Australian government confidence to, uh, to fund a large operational phase um, also managed by Ninti One. So this is the problem, uh, large numbers of, of uh, feral camels congregating, particularly during dry conditions, and having a range of impacts, um, including on, particularly on wetlands, and I'll show you some uh, photos of that uh, in a second. Um, on vegetation, um, a very large, uh, sorry, very high browse line that, uh, and feral camels are the only uh, herbivore in the Australian environment that can produce a browse line that high. Um, and major infrastructure impacts, including some, some um, unbelievable ones, such as um, a, a mob of camels over a, a number of days at a water point, uh, causing this uh, windmill to collapse, obviously at, at great expense to that pastoralist. Um, this is Northern Territory data um, presented in the, the Desert Knowledge CRC report. Um, and it's, it's basically showing that uh, something clearly needed to be done about camels based on this population trajectory. This was the, uh, the, dense, the distribution and density map in the DKCRC report, um, subsequently been updated with more aerial survey work and Carl's, Carl's talk after mine will, will show the revised map. But um, back then, uh, at the time that the DKCRC work was done, estimate of one million uh, camels 
and some pretty significant figures there in terms of the distribution on different land tenures with you know, around 40% on Aboriginal land, 20% pastoral, 10% uh, conservation and 25% crown. So the management challenge, uh, not surprisingly the Australian government as the, the major funder um, had its set of uh, expectations, particularly in relation to being able to verify uh, that camels were being removed as, as, uh, as reported and that that removal was humane and also a lot of environmental monitoring requirements to try and get improved information on the, on the impact of camels and impact reduction following, um, following camel management. Um, key stakeholders including commercial use industry and RSPCA um, and RSPCA are here today but RSPCA uh, um, accept the notion that, um, that pest animals may need to be controlled under some situations provided you can demonstrate the need for that control in terms of evidence of impact and that the DKCSC report was, was pretty key in that and provided you can, you can demonstrate that you're uh, implementing removal methods as, as humanely as possible. Um, comprehensive governance structure, which is uh, obviously going to be a requirement when you're dealing with four jurisdictions, um, Queensland, Northern Territory, WA, South Australia, plus of course Australian Government. You have uh, technical aspects to the project with lots of uh, scientists involved in monitoring as well as the operational side of the project. Large number of landholders, um, very mobile animals, and we had uh, a bit of a rainfall problem in, in year two of the project. Landholder perceptions are obviously everything in, uh, in doing uh, any form of natural resource management. Um, you obviously need access to, to the land to do the work, um, and so it's very important to get a handle on what those perceptions are. So this is the DKCRC findings. Um, some of these findings have changed over the, the life of this project and uh, Carl will talk about revised uh, perceptions of Aboriginal uh, people. Um, that work is continuing, it hasn't been completed so we don't have final results. But back when the DKCRC report was done, not surprisingly conservation managers just wanted the, the camels gone, they, they you know, weren't, weren't interested in commercial use options. Pastoralists, um, most managed camels, usually ground shooting. Um, but they recognised that commercial use could be an option. Aboriginal lands, um, just culturally, um, generally not comfortable with the idea of uh, shooting to waste, either from the air or from the ground, but at the same time growing frustration about impacts and, and definitely wanting something to happen in terms of reducing the number of camels. Uh, and the range of impacts you know, that the landholders themselves identified, infrastructure, livestock competition, um, biodiversity, water quality, cultural sites, um, human safety in terms of vehicle accidents and camels coming onto airstrips and camels coming directly into the communities themselves. Uh, and then also the um, greenhouse implications of um, feral camel emissions, um, methane emissions, as well as their impact on vegetation and carbon storage. So obviously this is part of the problem and, and this is why uh, there needs to be a national approach to camel management. Um, single animal, that, that total width of that scale, 60 kilometres, um, over a period of, I think of nine months or so, but um, obviously extremely mobile animals that, that don't exactly respect um, landholder borders or, or state and territory borders. And this is the sort of situation that we're trying to prevent, uh, or at least reduce the frequency of, whereby under dry conditions, uh, camels become fixed on a particular water source, they drink all the water quite quickly, denude all the surrounding vegetation, and um, then the ultimate result is, is a fairly bad animal welfare outcome for the camels themselves in terms of, of uh, dying of uh, thirst and starvation. So management options. Um, we, uh, we worked with the Invasive Animals CRC to do a review of what the management options were. No real uh, obvious biocontrol or fertility control candidates, certainly not in the, the medium term. Um, this slide is just to illustrate, <coughs> not sure how we can see that, but hopefully you can see, you can probably see a couple of eyes there anyway, but basically this is a motion activated camera shot at night time of a dingo climbing on a camel's back. <coughs> just to demonstrate the fact that they don't really have natural uh, predators in Australia, um, so hence um, we are reliant on, on these <coughs> as the main forms of management, aerial culling and, uh, and mustering. So in terms of the objectives at, at the, uh, the rock hole and the water hole or wetland sort of um, level, um, you know, these are the, the, 
the things that we're trying to avoid and <clears throat> across the top, these are the outcomes we're trying to achieve. So, so these, these rock holes are often culturally significant. Um, some of them can be uh, a couple of metres in diameter and, uh, and a couple of metres deep and so in those cases the whole carcass can end up in the rock hole and that's a um, <clears throat> pretty unpleasant job for Aboriginal rangers to have to, uh, to clear out those rock holes when that happens. Uh, these are the, the 20 project partners, a mix of government agencies, um, universities, SORO, uh, Aboriginal organisations and other landholder organisations such as NT Cattlemen's Association. In terms of achievements to date, um, we, have, uh, we have all the original uh, project partners still in the tent and we've added one and this, this collaboration um, has already demonstrated benefits for other form uh, benefits for other forms of natural resource management apart from feral camel management. We already have partners working together on other issues and we hope that that will continue into the future. Um, we've worked closely with the commercial use industry um, wherever commercial use is possible and uh, for well over half of the camel distribution it's just not feasible. Um, landholder consents in, are in place and uh, that has long term benefits for ongoing camel management and despite the washout in 2010-11, um, we've still managed to achieve um, removal of over 150,000 animals <laughs> and achievement of density targets in most assets with basically the objective is to get camels down to between 0.1 and, uh, and 0.5 animals per square kilometre at different assets. Um, we've worked with vets and with RSPCA oversight of this process. Um, we have um, a rigorous process for both mustering and aerial culling of, uh, of setting the standards of how that will be conducted, training against those standards and verification um, assessment against those standards to, to ensure that uh, animal welfare uh, concerns are being addressed. Um, comprehensive environmental monitoring um, and I think that will set an important baseline for, for future work, particularly on, uh, on desert wetlands. Um, we're improved knowledge of feral camel population dynamics, but that is, that is a continuing um, improvement in knowledge that we need to have. Um, it, it's not, it's not uh, an exact science, um, but it is a developing, developing knowledge. And importantly, capacity building for future management in both culling and commercial use. So this project should be considered the, um, the start rather than the end of nationally coordinated feral camel management, like all pest animals. Uh, if if uh, the management stops, uh, they will rebound. Uh, camels will rebound slower than most, but they will still obviously recover unless this, uh, this sort of management effort is maintained. Thank you. Thank you so much, Quentin. No one ever says this kind of work is easy. Getting from knowledge to practice is a tough thing, and I think in this case we see such a good example because we gathered all the knowledge as NT1 um, at a conference in Canberra in 2009, which led to the, the project that Quentin manages. And you can see just how complicated it is. There's environmental, science, um, economic, social and cultural aspects to this. So the next presentation really touches on the social and cultural parts because it's about uh, Aboriginal community perceptions of feral camels and engagement in the project. So I'd like to um, introduce Carl Hampton, who's Senior Research Officer with NINT1, together with uh, Danny Ware, um, who's from um, uh, Lincha Puerta community, otherwise known as Santa Teresa, and uh, Mervyn Raggett, who's from Andari community in Central Australia. They've come a long way to be here, and thanks for um, presenting to us. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to tell a story, um, particularly from our travels and uh, around Central Australia, South Australia and Western Australia. So as Quentin has said, uh, we've been out and about with Aboriginal community researchers interviewing people, surveying Aboriginal people in communities about what they think should happen uh, with feral camels. And uh, obviously there's been the report done in 2008 so it's been a few years since uh, some of that data was collected. Um, what I can say is also uh, with the community researchers, obviously we've got another session coming up and Tammy Abbott will talk a bit more about those people 
who uh, do a fantastic job for Ninti. But uh, certainly, in terms of the camel surveys, I've had to uh, rely very much on our Aboriginal community researchers, and it's a really important job that they do because, obviously, because of their knowledge, their language skills, their cultural knowledge, uh, and having Aboriginal people get out on the ground to actually do the research as well. And, uh, you know, particularly with the language uh, ability that they've got, uh, being able to get better quality information back, I think, is something that has really been a highlight. Uh, as you can see, we've got 48 community researchers that are based across um, the four states uh, and the Northern Territory. As I said, uh, many of them are fluent language speakers. Many of them speak four or five different Aboriginal languages. So very highly skilled people, very knowledgeable people and uh, a great uh, asset for our organisation. Uh, we use the, the research model where we get out on the ground under a tree uh, at the front of someone's uh, house on a community and do the face-to-face -face interviews on an iPad, a tablet. So, yeah, Phil, uh, certainly rely, uh, understand what you're saying in terms of the digital nomads. Uh, people out there are very savvy with technology and they love it. And it's a great way to get people in. Um, so we've done 33 communities so far across those states and territories. Uh, it's not complete, uh, but certainly by the end of August, hopefully we're going to be able to get out before the end of August and do a few more communities. But uh, we'll be wrapping things up at the end of August. Um, naturally, you know, it's not as easy as just getting in a car, going out and surveying people in a community. There's permits to be done and uh, certainly, you know, having great relationships with land councils is really important um, and having the respect for those communities, you know, ringing up, making sure there's no cultural or sorry business going on. Uh, this year we've had a fair bit of rain through the APY lands particularly, so that's made it very difficult for us to get out there and, and do those surveys. But certainly one of the ways around it is, again, IT, is uh, getting those people to come into Alice Springs, train up ACRs, and then send them back with an uh, uh, iPad and uh, they can do the, do the surveys themselves on the ground. I think one of the real strengths as well is, is it's actually creating employment in many of these communities where there is a very limited labour market and uh, certainly the workers' ACRs, and I'll get Danny and Mervyn to say a few words in a minute, but... Uh, it's a great source of employment and uh, a lot of the people out there in the communities love that type of work. It's casual, it's an on-needs basis depending on projects and uh, you know, there's some great rewards for them as well. Um, I will hand over to Danny and Mervyn. They'll talk a bit about what uh, their roles are. Mervyn's also an Aboriginal ranger with Jawampa out at Hermansburg. So uh, he's certainly got a lot of hands-on experience in terms of um, some of the management practices that, that they do to manage uh, particularly camels, but also horses. So I might hand over to Mervyn now and say a few words. Yeah, like, like Carl said, I'm Mervyn. We have all this problem with camels and things like that. Like, I'm, I'm a ranger as well. We do get involved with this feral animal work with camels and horses and stuff like that. You know, like out there, we we're doing our best to fence off the main water holes, springs, and other you know uh, vegetations and all that. But camels are too strong; they're almost knocking everything down. So, like, <laughs> we just can't win out there. Hello. Um, I'm Danny Ware. I'm originally from Queensland. Um, I'm married up to a lady in Santa Teresa. I've been there for 15 years and I've been doing this camel survey for about half a year, maybe a year. And what's that? Yeah. What about your travels? And, um, the yeah. and it's taken me all over the place, nearly one, seen different countries and communities. And it's been pretty good. Yeah. Thanks, Mervyn and Danny. That's taken a bit of courage for them to get up and speak. Normally, uh, Danny's not a quiet sort of person. He uh, loves to talk, particularly on those long road trips. Um, but look, we'll get into the summary of results so far. As, as uh, Quentin said, that it's not complete. We've still got a couple of weeks to get out there and do some more surveys. But to date, we've done 187 surveys across 20 communities. 
And one of the things we've identified is the amount of different la Aboriginal languages that are out there still uh, sp spoken fluently. So there's been 13 different languages identified from those 20 communities. And uh, as people have said today, you know, language is so important to people in the remote communities, it connects them to culture, to country. So that's uh, also in terms of camels. There's a lot of respect for camels out there in the Aboriginal communities. People in one shape or, an or another do have some sort of affiliation with them, whether it's through uh, Christianity or whether it's through their connection with the... Uh, the old pioneers, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal pioneers in the early days as when camels were used for transport. So there's a lot of respect for the, for the animal out there and uh, I suppose that shows in terms of why people and communities don't really want to see camels wasted. The top three most common places people see camels are along the road when travelling, in the bush when visiting country or homelands and near waterholes. So I don't think there's any surprises there. Just with that uh, photo there of the camel on the road, we were actually at Warakuna and people were warning me when I was going to be driving to Warburton uh, that to be careful about uh, camels sitting on the road and I sort of didn't really believe them. I'd never seen that before and getting a couple of hundred k's down the road and come across this. So, yeah, you know, the, the knowledge of people out there is, is so good and you've got to take that knowledge serious and, and listen to what they're saying because that's just a really simple example of, of that knowledge and what they said to me. So came across that uh, on our travels to Warburton. Um, how often have you seen camels in the last year is one of the questions in the survey. Majority of times are every month and a few times a year. So that, they're the two most common times uh, or how often people have seen them. Most common damage by camels seen by Aboriginal people surveyed are to trees and plants. And uh, with that it's uh, having a big impact on, uh, on trees and plants, particularly the native plants and the ability for people to be able to go out and get bush, bush food. Uh, and also for animals such as kangaroos, emus. You know, there's a lot of communities that don't even see those native animals around their community now um, because obviously the camels are eating, eating the, uh, the plants and they're going to have to go away further looking for more, for more food. So it is having a big impact, particularly on uh, Aboriginal hunting uh, in those communities. Around waterholes and rockholes, so no surprises there. And again, that photo was taken taken near uh, Warakuna, and uh, the the fence uh, there over the rockhole was built by school children probably 10 years ago, and uh, it's moved a little bit, but it's uh, held up pretty well uh, over 10 years. And uh, one of the great things about uh, the work I've been doing is you meet so many uh, fantastic and inspirational people, and uh, I met a lady at Warakuna. Daisy Ward, not sure if people have heard about her, but uh, there was actually the Ward case in Western Australia where her cousin had uh, passed, passed away in custody. And uh, Daisy took us under her wing straight away when she knew... Uh, she actually knew me from my previous job, believe it or not, so she's a very switched-on uh, elder. Uh, for those that don't know, I used to be a Member of Parliament in the Territory and uh, Daisy obviously remember, remembered me from those days and she thought I was still there, but I said, no... Unfortunately not. But uh, she took us under her wing and showed us part of her country. And she said, uh, I want you to put this photo in, in that report to the government to show them what we're doing on a local level. Uh, you know, the school children built this and it's still there 10 years later. So uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, lady, inspirational, and uh, that's one of the great things about the trips we've been doing. You meet so many knowledgeable people. Uh, and also the other, uh, just getting back to the most common damage, is to sacred sites as well. 60 responses out of the 187 people surveyed have identified working in the land management area. So again, uh, people like Mervyn, who are also Aboriginal rangers, uh, are doing a fantastic job on the ground. Uh, I think they're certainly the unheralded heroes in many ways. And I think in the Territory we've got about 40-odd Indigenous ranger groups uh, employing so many Indigenous people on the ground in the natural resource management area. So very important jobs people are doing out there. Um, Again, 22 people have identified as having received training in camel management, but I certainly think there's an opportunity for governments to get on board and uh, to get a bit more money into the communities to train people up in that land management area. Most popular practices for future camel management. These are the three most popular things people are saying to us from the surveys that should happen in the future. So people are saying there should be more mustering and trucking away of camels. 
There should be more fencing uh, them out of communities and particularly, uh, I suppose, the most uh, popular story people have probably heard about is, is that at uh, Docker River uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and also more on the ground shooting for local meat. So again, this photo is uh, of a gentleman at Warakuna. We turned up that afternoon and uh, the first people we, we meet were there cutting up a camel. So, you know, um, certainly a lot of people out there saying that they want to see that meat used properly and particularly in those communities for local meat. There's also, uh, as Quentin has said, acknowledgement that there are still too many camels and the numbers need to be reduced and, of course, through aerial culling uh, that's required in many situations. Um, so that's all from me and uh, thanks again to Danny and Mervyn for getting up and saying a few words. Thanks. We're going to switch gears now and, and talk about a different kind of, of animal through the precision pastoral work. Uh, we've got Tim Driver here with us today who's the director of Precision Pastoral Proprietary Limited which is a partner of Ninty One which was mentioned also this morning in the presentations. Um, Tim has many years' experience working in the pastoral industry. He's got intimate knowledge of the way that people think in the sector and the way that they work, and that's meant that he's brought a great deal to his work um, in the field of precision pastoral uh, in the company and in the work that they've done. So I'd like to invite Tim up to the lectern now. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, look, I'd like to speak to you today about Precision Pastoral, uh, give you an insight of how the company started, um, where its roots began from, the involvement that Nitti's had with the projects um, going through, but um, and also show you the actual product that we produce and uh, are looking to commercialise early this year, early next year. Um, but first, I'd just like to wind the clock back to 2006 to start with. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, being first introduced to uh, Jan Ferguson and Mark Ashley at a field day uh, at Parachilna in South Australia. Um, at that stage, I was um, working for a, uh, a company that um, uh, called Engineering that uh, I was a founding member of. Uh, we were an IT-based company looking to uh, find a, a, a use for automation in the livestock industry. Um, and through this, through this process um, of uh, meeting Jan and Mark, we, uh, we discovered that, uh, that Ninty and Cord had a lot of common interests and um, that a partnership could be, could be formed there. Um, I just want to go back now and recap this morning's slides that um, Andy and Sally um, had, uh, have already covered, but um, I think it's important to, to understand that, um, that the partial industry is, is and will remain a, uh, a stable, viable business within the rural community. Um, it pretty much shapes how Australians, I think, uh, believe and uh, conceive that uh, what rural Australia is all about, um, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. Um, also, what really, what I really became to understand in those early days, um, 2006 onwards, was that uh, that Ninti did understand the issues uh, affecting the long-term profitability of the pastoral sector. They um, through the work that I was uh, able to witness of the um, through the desert knowledge. Uh, desert knowledge program of the Water Smarts program um, really, really drove home to me that Ninti understood that there's a, there was a, there was a cost price squeeze happening to, with um, with producers. We um, and just refer back to Andy's slide this morning um, of the philosophy behind um, behind the, the actual industry is that input costs have been rising um, and but uh, kilos of beef. Uh, or the price paid per kilo of beef haven't haven't uh, risen in a one to one ratio, so for the sector, the sector needs to do two things: it needs to obviously drive its costs down, um, but also increase production. When you drive cost costs down, you can only drive costs so far. You will become a point where you'll be the most efficient, and then prices will then rise. So the only way to have a really big impact on the profitability of these businesses is that we have to increase production. If we want to increase production we've got to measure the system. So two ways um, that this, this could, uh, was identified this could actually happen was that uh, the uh, 21CP project was already looking at telemetry, so using telemetry to monitor water sources of cattle. That is one of the single greatest costs of, uh, to the partialists is actually supplying cattle with water, whether it's actually install of the infrastructure or 
um, or just purely monitoring it on a day-to-day -day basis, driving around their properties, which may be a 500k bore run, um, doing that three times a week, that becomes a very expensive exercise, especially with the cost of diesel rising. Um, the technology was identified that it could really help to just get that information back onto your computer, check it in the morning, and be able to do one bull run a week instead of three, and then respond to any problems um, that, that may occur on your, on your morning run. So it actually meant that the waters were monitored more frequently. Um, we, uh, rather than being monitored only three times a week, they were now monitored every day. So that was a, that's a real big pick up, um, from, also from animal welfare uh, practice. But the other side is that we really needed to increase production from the livestock asset. Um, and when working with Nissi in the, in the early days, I was, uh, I was able to attend a, a, few, um, uh, a few field days that they were hosting. And I was really impressed with the WaterSmart project. But very, what, what, what impressed me the most was the method that Nissi um, and the CRC had, um, had adopted. They were engaging partialists as researchers. They were paying partialists to, to actually um, collect the information and feedback to Nissi. Now, to this, to me, that, um, that highlighted that just pulls down the barrier between research and adoption. Um, there's always been a problem with the agricultural sector uh, with research. It can, can take up to 10 years to be adopted by the, uh, by the industry. Um, we see that um, all over the sector in, in all different parts, not only in the live, livestock production. But this was a way I could see that it could really break down those barriers and get quick adoption. So, just moving on to the product um, that uh, that was, uh, I suppose, conceived within the Desert Knowledge um, Desert Knowledge uh, CRC, we looked at if we're going to increase production, we need to measure it. Measurement comes at a cost. If we're going to measure an animal, we have to put the animal in the yard. We have to then muster it. We have to then uh, run it through the crush. We then have to let it go. All those things add costs. And when you've got a uh, you've got ten thousand plus cattle, uh, that cost far outweighs the benefit of the information that you collect. So we needed a, a more effective way of doing it. And this is where technology, we can see this idea of, this, uh, of the remote livestock management system. Um, cattle in Australia have a RFID tag in their ear um, as a unique, a unique ID. So we thought this was a perfect platform for us to, um, uh, to use. So um, I'm just going to explain the components of the system here. The animals walk through, it records their ear tag, they cross a scale so we're able to get their weight. Um, we have the opp opportunity to then uh, draft those animals out or separate those animals out for whatever management practice that we might want to uh, enact. Um, we also, it's, it has, the whole system has to be solar powered and we also need to have that telemetry link back so the information can flow back to the producer on a timely basis. I'll just like to show you a video of the product actually in operation. Um, this is a short video. Um, so I'd just like to explain what's going on here. So um, these animals are walking in out of a paddock. The paddock is quite large. It's about 100,000 100, acres. They go out to graze. Every day when they, when they require a drink of water or if they also want a supplement, uh, they present themselves to the auto drafter, uh, to the remote livestock management system. And as they walk forward, you can probably hear the ear tag read. Um, that registers their ear tag. If they take four steps on the platform, we can register their live, their live weight, their body weight. And we can also then, well, as, as we're doing here, action a draft. So we can now remotely, automatically separate animals without having to go through and muster those animals and go to that huge, huge, uh, huge cost. Um, for this particular draft, we're actually just drafting out, um, uh, drafting out uh, old cows. So any bit of information that we can log towards that um, uh, the RFID tag remotely, uh, we, can, we can now place an action. just want to give you a snapshot of this, the type of information that the producer, uh, that the producer receives back at his uh, computer at the homestead. And I just must stress, this is the first time that uh, we've been able to document a, anim a daily weight gain for an animal um, in the rangeland. Generally, in these systems, we may get an opportunity to measure cattle once or twice a year. This gives us a daily measure of the animal's performance, and it's real time. So as you can see here, um, we just see a growth pattern of a, of a steer over, um, over a 12-month uh, period. With this information, um, we can now overlay other, bits of, uh, other key indicators. So um, as you can see, the, the bar graph there is actually indicating rainfall. So now we can actually identify what the actual effect of rainfall is on live weight gain of the cattle. This is very important because then we can really start to put prediction models in place. Forward contracting really opens up a whole new... Um, a whole new uh, marketing exercise that, that producers haven't actually uh, had uh, in the range and been able to 
to, uh, to adopt. Um, but then also we can, we can also add market prices in as well, so we can uh, uh, help the producer make the, make, the, uh, make the right decision when to sell. So when the animals are the heaviest they are and when you can get the, get the right price. So after this trial work had completed, um, Ninty Wine and Cord decided that this is something that would be very useful to the, um, very useful to the industry. It has a commercial, commercial benefit to the industry and the industry were actually asking for it. So in 2010, um, Ninty Wine and Cord spun off the IP um, that was held within two organisations into Precision Partial, which is I currently now head up. Um, and Precision Pastoral is tasked with um, commercialising that IP that came out of the Desert Knowledge CRC. Um, today, where we are, where we, we are today, uh, Precision Pastoral is currently administering a Commercialisation Australia grant that um, was only made possible through Ninty's actually hard cash contribution to Precision Pastoral. Um, not only has Ninty put time and effort, knowledge, um, but also hard cash forward, which became um, a, as seed capital. So that enabled us to um, apply for funding dollar for dollar. Um, currently we have about 12, oh, it's actually, sorry, 12 uh, pre-commercial systems successfully being trialled on eight properties across Northern Beef and this is, these are in their last stages um, and performing extremely well. Um, Precision Partial is currently creating new online software tools to assist, um, assist in on-farm management decisions whilst also participating in the next generation of research uh, being undertaken by the REP CRC. Um, and look, and I just would like to take this opportunity to uh, ex express my thanks to the NITI, um, NITI board and to NITI organisation as a whole. Um, without their vision um, and their help and their financial backing, um, Position Partial wouldn't exist today. So thank you very much. The next subject continues on the theme of, of knowledge to practice. Uh, we've got John Gunther who's going to present to us. It's on the subject of remote education systems. Now, you might think there's already a lot of knowledge in education, which is true, but the, the challenge for, for Ninty One in this project is to actually achieve some outcomes that are better for um, young people in remote Australia through the, through the research that he's doing. So John is an experienced person in this field. Um, before joining Ninty One as a full-time project leader, he's principal research leader for remote education systems. He worked for around 10 years evaluating remote projects and programs, so he brings a wealth of knowledge to this, to this subject, and uh, I'd like to invite him now to the lectern to speak to us. John Gunther. Thanks, Steve, and uh, uh, thanks uh, uh, for everyone for, for being here to, to listen this afternoon. Um, before I do begin, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, the team that uh, is working with me, because it's not just me. Uh, we've got uh, Sam Osborne, who's an experienced uh, educator and principal from South Australia, who's working with us in Alice Springs, and Samantha Disbray, who's recently come from uh, the Northern Territory um, uh, Department of Education, Children's Services. Um, we've also got some great students. Uh, You've already heard Phil uh, give his talk this, this morning, which was great. And uh, Patricia Burke, who's been working as a teacher in the Nundurra lands. And uh, we've got Byron, who's uh, uh, working with us uh, across the Interplay project as well. So a really interesting mix of uh, projects uh, in those PhDs and a, and a great team to work with, and I'm really privileged to do that. I once uh, heard uh, a principal in a remote school describe the remote education uh, issue as an intransigent problem, a problem that won't go away, a problem that's stubborn and uh, is, uh, is very difficult to deal with. One of the, the, the difficulties with that notion, and I hear lots of people say similar things, is that what we sometimes do is we think that that intransigence is the, the, the student's problem or it's the problem of families. But what we have come to, to realise is that we need to think a little bit differently about remote education. We also need to talk differently about remote education so that ultimately we can respond differently to remote education. So we're on this journey of thinking, talking and responding differently about remote education. We come to the project with four research questions. 
And these are the, are the questions that underpin and drive our work. And the first question might seem a bit strange if you come from an urban context and you know what education is about, because it's often about uh, getting people into work, it's often about getting people into further training, uh, it's a springboard to a career. But in many remote communities, uh, the rationale or the reason for education is not quite so clear. And so we ask the question, what is education for in remote Australia and what can or should it achieve? And second, uh, beyond that, we, we ask what defines successful educational outcomes from the remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander standpoint. Again, in uh, urban and non-remote contexts, uh, success is pretty clear. It's about things like retention, it's about year 12 completion, it's about transition into university. But I wonder, and we wonder, what success looks like from a community perspective. And then if, if we understand what that success looks like, how do teachers teach to that success? And that's a, a, a really important question. And, and fourthly, how can we get the, the, the education system to respond to, to the needs of local communities in remote Australia? We're in the process of uh, gathering our data right now. And uh, that data comes in various forms. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we're in the process of doing community surveys. Uh, and so far we've done them in, in 10 different remote communities around uh, the remote area. Um, and we've got Lorraine working with us uh, on that one, which is great. We're also doing in-depth interviews with, uh, with people uh, on, on the, the topics uh, that we've identified before. And what does success look like? What does aspiration look like? We're running a series of what are effectively focus groups with uh, people who are engaged in, in remote education in one way or another, which we're calling thinking outside the tank. Uh, and um, if you haven't uh, experienced one of these yet, uh, we're, we're taking this tool around Australia with us to engage those that are interested in remote education to give them a chance to say their piece about what they think uh, is going on in the remote education space. We're also using quali quantitative data sets like my school uh, data and census and uh, other secondary data sources. And recently we've um, uh, come to an agreement with uh, the Australian Council for Educational Research and uh, Principals Australia Institute to gather data from their collegial snapshot surveys in remote schools, again, to get a better understanding of what those communities think about success in education. We've got a very active advisory group who are also providing input and uh, their pictures are shown uh, below there. People are like uh, Andrea Mason from NPY Women's Council, uh, Jeannie Herbert, an experienced educator uh, who's, who has previously headed up Bachelor Institute. Um, we've got uh, Greg Wern, who's uh, been a, a principal in, in the, the top end uh, community of Yurikala for a number of years. Howard Bath, the Children's Commissioner. These are top people who are really contributing actively to our, our work and giving us great input and feedback. So what have we found? Firstly, those, those questions about success and uh, aspiration don't necessarily apply in remote communities the same way they do in mainstream communities. And uh, in this uh, photo here with Ruben, uh, Sam is actually coming to grips with him about this whole idea about aspiration and success. And his ideas were really quite insightful about the different ways that uh, success and aspiration are perceived in remote communities. Uh, secondly, uh, th those deficits, uh, uh, the, the intransigence, uh, if you like, uh, of the system are not necessarily seen the same way by remote community members. So we often, in the mainstream, talk about educational disadvantage, but we don't necessarily hear the same rhetoric coming from communities themselves. Um, um, the, the issue of engagement uh, in learning is to a large extent dependent on culture and community. Some of the analysis that we've done has shown that uh, simply labelling people as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander is not what makes the greatest difference but their attachment to culture is something that does make a huge difference. Um, some of the strategies that uh, have been used don't necessarily improve outcomes. We've seen 
uh, over the last five years, any number of different national partnership agreements. We've seen uh, closing the gap programs. We've seen all sorts of attempts to improve outcomes in schooling across remote Australia, but not a lot has changed, um, with some exceptions, of course. But um, uh, we, we see that that culture and worldview is the, is the thing that does make a, a tremendous difference more than distance. So remoteness, even though we talk about remote uh, disadvantage, uh, remoteness is not a, a key issue as much as cultural and worldview is. So how do we want to uh, get people to think and talk differently and then how do we want uh, to apply the learnings of our research uh, as we go forward? One of the things that we'd like people to think about differently is uh, shifting the focus away from attendance or bums on seats towards real world learning. So it's often assumed that uh, improving attendance will improve uh, uh, learning, but it's not necessarily the case. And some of our analysis certainly supports that, uh, that statement there. We know also from our analysis that punitive measures don't work to improve outcomes either. Um, the, uh, the attention given to trying to get um, parents and students to comply uh, sometimes just end up in resistance. We also believe that uh, rather than focusing on those punitive measures, we should be rather redirecting resources towards building local capacity and engaging our communities, our remote communities, in the learning process. So for example, we find that um, assistant teachers are often under-trained uh, under uh, and don't have the skills that they are required to actively engage in the classroom. And we sometimes find that governance structures uh, are, don't represent the, the community's interests. So we believe that there are some real opportunities to focus attention away from compliance strategies towards uh, uh, engaging the community and building the capacity of communities. We think that there are opportunities, despite the attention towards uh, getting a nationalised curriculum, towards getting a uh, curriculum that will reflect the needs of local communities. So for example, dealing with things in school that are relevant to local communities. So for example, negotiating with mining companies, helping students understand how the local politics works and supporting their, um, their leadership aspirations towards governance in their communities. So I think there are all sorts of opportunities for shifting the way that uh, curriculum works in schools. One idea that we've got is to set up two-way knowledge exchanges through partnerships with city-based schools. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, the solution is often seen in remote communities to, to get kids out of communities and into boarding schools. And that may work for some students, but we believe that there's opportunities for two-way knowledge exchanges so that, that students can um, engage in uh, high-intensity immersion programs for maybe a month uh, in an urban context, but the, the reverse can happen as well, that non-Indigenous uh, students could come to remote schools to do some learning about uh, what happens in a remote context and, and learn about Aboriginal culture as well. So um, there, are, there, are, there are other things that we can do, uh, like focusing rather on the content of learning, but on building, in, instead of focusing on content, focusing on the confidence that's required to engage in learning. And uh, a further idea is uh, setting up separate spaces for post-primary students, because we know that uh, the greatest drop-off of students occurs in the, in the high school years, and that one of the barriers to engagement is about the, the idea of actually engaging in uh, a space that is set up for children. So, that, I guess, is a, a small snapshot of where we're up to with our uh, remote education systems project. It's a, a, a long journey, uh, but a journey that I think has the opportunity and, and uh, presents possibilities to, to really change the way we, we think and talk and respond to the needs of remote communities in this really important area of education.
Thank you very much.